I'm going to be discussing green prediction with a focus on a particular paper which was submitted for publication about 25 years ago. And this was a study of the reliability of indexes for predicting the outcome of trials of weaning from mechanical ventilation. On joining the faculty at the University of Texas in 1980, one of the first projects I undertook was a, an investigation into the pathophysiological mechanisms of acute ventilatory failure where we used ventilatory failure as a model of nature. The prevailing wisdom at the time was that hypercapnia was caused by respiratory center depression. As weaning failure patients developed significant increases in PCO2, we found, however, that they developed increases in respiratory motor output and instead, the hypercapnia was the result of rapid shallow breathing, which produced an increase in dead space. The onset of the rapid shallow breathing was dramatic. It occurred as soon as the ventilator was discontinued. I wondered whether these findings might be applied to one of the most frustrating clinical problems of the day deciding when is the right time to wean a patient from the ventilator. The ultimate goal of weaning is extubation. And this is virtually always preceded by a trial of spontaneous breathing. How do we know when is the right time to do the trial of spontaneous breathing? We can <coughs> decide to undertake it based on our clinical impression or just doubt and heuristics, or we can screen for weanability using predictor tests. Kahneman and Tversky are psychologists who received the Nobel Prize for research on how people form judgments in the midst of uncertainty. Much of their research was focused on heuristics and they showed that heuristics commonly lead to systematic and predictable errors. This is borne out by the first two randomized trials on weaning techniques where 60 to 80 percent of patients ventilated for a week or more had the ventilator successfully removed on the first day that they were evaluated for weaning. Many of these patients probably could have had the ventilator removed a day or several days earlier. That is, relying on just doubt or heuristics alone delays the initiation of weaning. Instead, it's essential to screen for weaning readiness using a weaning predictor test. In the 1980s, as shown by this survey, weaning predictors consisted of blood gases maximum inspiratory pressure, and vital capacity. In our subsequent New England paper, we commented how studies had shown that predictive indices, or the predictive power of these indices, was very poor. Our explanation for the poor performance of the indexes was that they did not accurately reflect the true pathophysiological determinants of weaning outcomes. To see if indexes based on our 1986 paper might be more reliable as a predictor, Carl Yang, who was a fellow in my lab at the time, <laughs> obtained physiological recordings in a hundred patients from which we computed ten different weaning predictor tests. To capture the degree of rapid shallow breathing, we used a simple ratio where we divided the respiratory frequency by tidal volume, with tidal volume measured in liters. And this then uh, gave a cutoff value of 100. Uh, so of the first 10 weenie predictors that we studied, the F over VT ratio turned out to be the single most accurate index. 
and fortuitously the threshold that separated the weaning success from the weaning failure patients was an easy to remember number, 100. <laughs> Our study design differed markedly from that of previous predictor studies. All previous studies had been based on post hoc data analysis, which markedly inflates the reported reliability of a weaning predictor test. Instead, we first determine the threshold values for each predictor in a training data set, which was in the first 36 patients of the study. And then we investigated the reliability of these threshold values in a prospective validation set. For this, we used the remaining 64 patients of the study. We expressed our results in terms of sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value. And actually back in 1991, doing such an approach was actually quite novel at that time for looking at predictor tests. And we also characterized the results in terms of receiver operating characteristic curves, which measured the overall predictive value of each index. Unlike calculation of sensitivity and specificity, the receiver operating characteristic curve analysis does not depend on a single threshold value. And this is a huge advantage when evaluating the power of a diagnostic test. This, I believe, was the very first use of ROC analysis in any area of critical care. So looking back in terms of what regrets I have about the original study, my regrets relate to what I wish I had stressed in the original paper <laughs> so as to minimize problems that have arisen during the subsequent studies of F over VT. First, I wished that we had strongly emphasized that spontaneous breathing means breathing without any ventilator assistance. I did not foresee that subsequent researchers would bend the English language and interpret spontaneous breathing to also include pressure support and CPAP. As described in our original paper, we measured tidal volume and respiratory rate while the patient was completely disconnected from the ventilator circuit and also disconnected from receiving supplemental oxygen. We used a handheld spirometer that was attached to the end of the endotracheal tube. And this is the approach we still use to this day. Many subsequent researchers have ignored this point and they've measured F over VT in the presence of pressure support or CPAP as if these have no effect on the values. But pressure support of as little as 5 has a huge effect on F over VT. Likewise, CPAP of 5 has a huge effect on your measurement of F over VT. I remain baffled when researchers claim that these differences are irrelevant and can be ignored. A physician's guesstimate of a patient's work of breathing applies every bit as much as evaluating a patient for extubation as it does to evaluating a patient during a weaning trial. In the ICU, some physicians perform a guesstimate of a patient's work of breathing while the patient is receiving a pressure support of five or a CPAP of five. But compared with work of breathing in the extubated state, if you're breathing through the circuit without any CPAP or without any pressure support, such as with a flow-by option on the ventilator circuit, the decrease in the work of breathing is about 1% or negligible. In contrast, a CPAP of 5 or a pressure support of 5 decrease the patient's work of breathing by about 40%. No pharmacological agent can remotely achieve a decrease in work of breathing of this magnitude. 
when evaluating a patient's readiness for extubation, the thing you most want to avoid is that a decrease in the patient's work of breathing compared with what it's going to be following extubation. You want to make sure that the patient is doing all of the work of breathing and that none of the work of breathing is being done by the ventilator before extubation. The vast majority of patients can cope with a 40 to 60 percent increase in work of breathing at the point of extubation. But a fragile patient may not. So to extubate a fragile patient directly from a CPAP of five or a pressure support of five is to risk killing that patient. My second regret regarding the original paper is that I should have <coughs> emphasized that a weaning predictor test operates as a screening test. In the paper we said that the purpose of weaning indexes is to identify the earliest time that a patient can resume spontaneous breathing. That is, it's purely a screening test, nothing else. I fail to recognize the extent to which clinicians employ a monolithic approach to diagnostic testing, where they believe that a test is a test is a test. Physicians know that you don't screen for diabetes by performing a glucose tolerance test. Instead, when you screen for diabetes, you use a dipstick in a urine sample. Yet physicians may fail to make a clear distinction between screening tests and confirmatory tests in many other areas of diagnostic testing. The purpose of weaning predictors is to spot the earliest time that a patient might be ready for ventilator disconnection. Ever before you begin to think about doing a teaching trial. Weaning predictors are not designed to predict which patients will fail an extubation attempt. That is the purpose of a T-tube trial. This subtle but crucial distinction between a screening test and a confirmatory test is unfortunately missed by many physicians because they employ a monolithic approach to diagnostic testing. Physicians overlook the fact that a weaning predictor test constitutes a form of diagnostic testing. As such, the predictor test must obey all the rules for the proper application of diagnostic tests. So what are the characteristics of an ideal weaning predictor test. <clears throat> so here we have three different diagnostic tests with a test A has a sensitivity 0.96, specificity 0.7, <coughs> test B has a sensitivity 0.7, specificity 0.96, test C has a sensitivity 0.83, specificity also 0.83. So which of these tests is best? Well, that question is unanswerable. You cannot answer the question unless you know the task for which the test is about to be used. Again, many physicians view diagnostic testing with a monolithic orientation. They make no distinction between one test and another test. But in reality, diagnostic testing has to satisfy two very different tasks. The purpose, the first is screening and the other is confirmation. The purpose of screening is to pick up cases of a condition as early as possible, whereas the purpose of a confirmatory test is to confirm an already strongly suspected condition. A good screening test requires a test with a high sensitivity. A good confirmatory test requires a test with a high specificity, totally different. A screening test should be done when the suspicion is low. A confirmatory test should be performed when the suspicion is high. 
For example, in the diagnosis of lung cancer, a chest x-ray is a good screening test, but a very poor confirmatory test, whereas the complete opposite holds for the use of bronchoscopy. <coughs> Alvin Feinstein, the founding father of clinical epidemiology, pointed out that a single test can seldom be excellent both for the goals of screening and confirmation. With rare exceptions, other than proponents in the diagnosis of myocardial infarct, most tests are not sensitive enough to uh, simultaneously detect cases and also specific enough to avoid false positives. So it's essential that when you're evaluating a diagnostic test that you know for what task the test is being used. And weaning predictor tests are used only for screening, not for confirmation, though they are often evaluated as if they're for confirmation. So the goal of a screening test is to pick up cases of a condition as early as possible. That screening hinges on minimizing the false negative results, that means a test predicting failure, but the patient actually succeeds, and maximizing the true positive results, which is a test predicting success and the patient does actually succeed. And this is captured exactly by sensitivity. The sensitivity, the formula for it is true positive over true positive plus false negative. If we look here in terms of the sensitivity of F over VT, in 27 studies, the average sensitivity was 0.89. 85% of the studies reported sensitivities above 0.90. Yet some people recommend that you begin screening with a spontaneous breathing trial, despite the fact that we have no idea what is the sensitivity of this test. And obviously we can't find out because met ethics makes it impossible. To find out what is the sensitivity of a spontaneous breathing trial, you would need to extubate patients who had already failed a T-tube trial. And despite this lack of awareness, people still go ahead and recommend that you begin screening with a spontaneous breathing trial, which makes no sense. A confirmatory test is to confirm a condition for which there is already a strong suspicion. Confirmation hinges on minimizing the false positive results, which is a test predicting success, but the patient actually fails, and maximizing the true negative results, which is a test predicting failure, and the patient actually does fail. So specificity captures exactly these conditions because of the formula for specificity being true negatives over true negatives plus false positives. So my third regret regarding our original report is that I failed to emphasize that the evaluation of all diagnostic tests, including weaning predictors, must strictly obey Bayesian principles. Bayes' original paper was written, uh, or published rather, in 1763, and the formula for Bayes' theorem is shown here, and this serves as the foundation stone for every diagnostic test in every single field of medicine, whether it's orthopedics, gynecology, or critical care medicine. The importance of Bayes' theorem is illustrated by the following example. So say you have a very good diagnostic test that has a false positive rate of 5%, a false negative rate of only 0%, and the incidence of disease is 1 in 1,000. A randomly selected patient undergoes testing, the test comes back positive. What is the chance that the person has the disease with this excellent diagnostic test? When Harvard physicians were asked this question, most of them answered that the correct answer was 95% whereas in truth the correct answer is less than 2%. Those that answer 95% commit the base rate fallacy. They ignored the incidence of disease. 
So this is analogous to when you <coughs> see zebras and you hear hoofbeats. Then the next time that you hear hoofbeats, you conclude that there must be zebras that are outside your window. Whereas in fact, it's far more likely that there are horses. Because there's far more horses running around than there are zebras. So to avoid the base rate fallacy, you must take the pretest probability of weaning success into account. And this is your clinical just out. In his textbook on medical decision analysis, uh, Carl Sachs, the former editor of the Annals of Internal Medicine, said perhaps the most important idea in this book is the following. The interpretation of a test result depends on the pretest probability of disease. Here we see the relationship between pretest probability and post-test probability for a very good diagnostic test. Both have a sensitivity and specificity of 0.9. So if your pretest probability is 0.4 and you get back a positive result, you can reach a post-test probability of 0.9. So this is an increase of 0.5 units. Now, if your pretest probability is 0.8, a positive result has a much smaller effect, going from about post-test probability of about 0.9 up to about 0.97, despite the fact that you have an identical sensitivity and specificity. So this is a huge problem in weaning research, because more than 50% of the predictor studies have been conducted in populations where the pretest probability of weaning success is greater than 75%. In which case, a weaning predictor has very little chance to substantially increase the post-test probability. Here I have modified Bayes' equation for its use as weaning prediction. And looking at the computation of positive predictive value and negative predictive value, it's readily apparent that pretest probability is the fulcrum around which everything revolves. If you ignore this point, then the entire Bayesian edifice completely collapses. Since our original report, the accuracy of F over VT in predicting weaning outcome has been evaluated by at least 27 groups of investigators, making it perhaps the most reinvestigated phenomenon in critical care. Some groups found it reliable, and other groups found it unreliable. If we look at reports of positive predictive value in these studies, we observe a very wide scatter of results from 1 down to almost 0.5. So at first blush, the wide scatter of these results suggests that F over VT is unreliable. But this viewpoint fails to take into account the pretest probability, which as I pointed out to you, is the crucial Bayesian determinant of any diagnostic test. So here is the relationship between pretest probability and the positive predictive value for each of those individual studies. And here I've added the curve that was generated using Bayes' theorem and the sensitivity and specificity that we reported in our original 1991 study. And here I've added the 95% confidence intervals around that predicted value. And when the values reported by subsequent investigators are superimposed on this curve, most of the studies fall close to the relationship predicted by our original study. The weighted Pearson correlation coefficient between the observed data in the 27 studies and our prediction is 0.86. So the correlation provides a de facto confirmation of the sensitivity and specificity 
that we reported in our original 1991 paper. So in conclusion, the thoughts in the frequency to tidal volume paper began with investigations into fundamental mechanisms of control of breathing, specifically with research on the pattern of breathing, which provided insights into the mechanisms of weaning failure. This knowledge was then merged with fundamental principles of diagnostic testing. And this led to the introduction of a practical index for ventilator weaning. Thank you.